Hello, hello. And welcome to a Beatles program, which is called Things We Said Today. This is a weekly show in which we talk about anything and everything that has to do with the Beatles. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the four regular co-hosts of the show, also known for my syndicated Beatles program called Every Little Thing. And I'm being joined by my regulars, first of all, a contributing writer for Billboard.com and Axis.com, A-X-S.com, that is. And that's Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. We also have the executive editor of Beatle Fan Magazine. Legendary. And- legendary. I'm, I'm Le- stealing from Morning Joe. Legendary. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Everyone here is legendary on the show. Well, that's, this that's is true. true. That's okay. true. Anyway, that being our very own Al Sussman. Hi, Al. Hi, Ken. Hello there, everybody. And also we have our resident musicologist who also writes for Beatle Fan, the Wall Street Journal, occasionally writes for the New York Times as well, for many years worked in the classical department uh, for the Times, and that is Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hey, Ken. Hello, everyone. And we have a very special guest with us on the show this time out, and we know him for... His work primarily with Paul McCartney, first working on the Ram album, and also being the very first drummer in Wings. And we welcome to the show, Denny Sywell. Hi, Denny. Hello, everybody. How are you from sunny California? <laughs> okay. For the rest of us, it's been snowing. Well, actually, not well, for not, you and Steve. Not, not, for, not for me. Yeah, it's, not, it's, actually, it's actually kind of spring out here, uh, spring weather out here today. All so, right. we'll rub it in. <laughs> We're not going to talk about the weather now, are we, guys? No. <laughs> no, for the next hour. Yeah. <laughs> oh, pro- anyway, promise, Danny. Danny is actually one of the guests that will be at the Fest for Beetle fans, March 3rd through the 5th at the Hyatt Regency in Jersey City, New Jersey. And um, he's come to talk to us about his time with Paul and also what's going on with him today. Before we do that, I want to just mention a few quick things in the news. Uh, We have found out, and actually this will be old news by the time this gets posted, but at the Grammy Awards, the Beatles have won for uh, Best Music Film for the documentary of Eight Days a Week, The Beatles Touring Years. As it should be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was incredible, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. You enjoyed it, yes, Denny? Oh my God, yes! I went over to a friend of mine, Wag Wagner, who actually did the underscore for the movie. And an underscore is important. If you notice it, it isn't a good one. But it was there. All the underscore music was done by a partner of mine, uh, Wag Wagner. Uh, we just call him Wag. Uh-huh. And uh, his partners did that, and he had a screening down at his house. And uh, I was blown away. I, I told Ring uh, Ringer. Ringo. I call him Richard. You know, he likes to be called Rich or Richard. And I, I, I told Richard, uh, Richard after watching the, uh, the movie, cause they had some incredible clips that were never seen of him before, especially in the early days when he played so unbelievably well, I was like mm-hmm. just showering him with compliments. Um, and, uh, especially during that period of time when, uh, they're saying, Oh, Ringo isn't a great drummer. And, uh, Oh, my God, it was so good. I'm showering him with compliments, and he had tears in his eyes. He was so moved. It was, uh, wow. it was uh, quite a special moment for me, actually. Was, yes. that the first time, was that the first time he had seen it, Denny? Oh, I don't know. Uh, I think he'd seen it in several times. Uh, I was a late bloomer. A lot of people have saw, uh, saw the film before I did. Mm. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's and, cool that you got to see it with him. Mm-hmm. I mean, he um, was just fierce. He played fierce. Yeah. We've talked a lot about that, the the Washington Coliseum show in particular. You just watch Ringo on your Mesmerized. Yeah. Oh, my God. He was so strong. So high. (laughs) Yeah, it was. was, was, uh, Well, Ron Howard really pulled some stuff out that that, that nobody's ever seen. And uh, it was brilliant. Um, Bravo, Ron. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Also, we want to point out the sad news that on this day we learned of the passing of uh, Al Jarreau, who was a, a great singer who blended pop and R&B and jazz. And um, I just want to mention this one connection that Al had to a Beatle, and that is that there was an album that came out in 2006 called Giving It Up, and it was by George Benson with Al Jarreau, and Paul joined the two of them 
uh, on a cover of Bring It On Home to Me, the Sam Cooke song. Oh, nice. nice. And they, they sounded great together. And sure. also, uh, another thing here, I just got an email from our friend Tom Franjone, mm-hmm. who wanted to point out to us, because he, he noted the passing of Al Jarreau and about right. that recording, but mm-hmm. playing bass playing bass on that recording of Bring It On Home to Me was Abe Laboreal. Yeah. The father. Oh, playing yeah. bass. Oh, yeah. 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 Which I didn't know. Uh-huh. Yeah. All right. So. Great bass player. I used to do a lot of recording with Abe Sr. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you knew, and you knew Al Jarreau as well, right? You, you were I did. To I, us. I wouldn't say that we were close, but I spent a lot of time with him, uh, off and on over the years, I never got the opportunity to work with him, which would have been a thrill. But, uh, I, you know, he always went to the pool, man. He got some great guys to play with it in his bands over the years. And he was a, a true musician singer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, his did voice you, was, was very flexible. He could do so many things with it. Mm-hmm. Danny, yeah. did, you, did you mention that George Benson is on that song, too? Yeah. It, I didn't it, mention it. Oh, did you yeah. mention it, Ken? Yeah, it's yeah. a George it, Benson it's his album. album. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. And uh, also, Al Jarreau was a big Beatle fan, and he used to perform She's Leaving Home live. So, uh, right. And he did release a version of that, too. So very sad news mm-hmm. to hear about Al Jarreau. Yeah. Trouble is, we're getting to the age when there's a lot of sad news. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, we have yeah. this every week, really. <laughs> yeah. 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 But anyway, let's move on and talk about... Your work, especially with Paul McCartney, which started with the Ram album. I just Mm -hmm. want to start the conversation by telling me what it was like for you initially to work with him. And what did you observe about working with Paul and the way that he recorded his music? You know, was there anything different about the process with him? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Well, first of all, you know, I was selected out of the herd in New York. We were he he auditioned many of the, the top guns in New York that were doing all of the recording, all the albums and stuff. And uh, he just liked my attitude and my playing. And uh, as he said in many interviews, and so when I showed up at work the first day, I mean, you could tell that this was not just another session. You weren't going in there. They weren't handing you a chart with the, uh, with the bar count and the pushes and the stops and all of that stuff. They weren't, uh, this, this is a, a, a clean palette. And I, I had a kind of, put on a different head for recording with Paul because, you know, I listened to all of the Beatles music. I was fascinated by the, uh, the McCartney solo album where he played everything. And mm. I mean, I was a big fan of Ringo's, but after hearing him drum on it, I, I could see where, where he, he was also a huge fan of Ringo's. And uh, anyway, uh, so when I went into the, the first day recording, which was, uh, the, the first cut, that we uh, recorded was uh, just another day. Mm-hmm. And after he, he would walk in, it was just, well, that day it was Dave Spinoza, Paul, and I. That was it. And he just started playing the song, and Dave and I just kept looking at each other like, wow, this is uh, pretty intense. <laughs> Dave, Dave and, being uh, Dave Spinoza? Yes, right. yes. He did. I don't remember how many tracks, but he he was the initial call. It was uh, David Spinoza and myself and Paul were that was the initial rhythm section, mm-hmm. and we only re- we recorded uh, I don't know a handful of tracks, and then Dave had some sort of a conflict or something, and Paul asked me to uh, uh, recommend another guitar player, and I'd worked a lot with Dave Spinoza and also Hugh McCracken, right. so I said th- I said why don't you give Hugh a call? I think you'll really like him. And he was brought in, and he played on like Uncle Albert and uh, uh, most of the tracks. I would say they probably played on a quarter of the tracks, and and Hugh p- played on the rest. Uh, I'm not certain about that that number now, but but anyway, it started out, and you know, we Paul would walk in, and he'd play either acoustic guitar or piano and sing us a song one time through, so we'd get get an idea of what we were going to be working on that day. And it was it was very complicated stuff. It wasn't just a, a tune, uh, you know, a verse, chorus, chorus, bridge, and uh, and out. You know, it was uh, complicated. These were like little. Each song was a masterpiece, and uh, and I, you know, I would just get excited. And, and uh, 
he would uh we'd start we'd have a you know get our sounds up on for the control room and we would start putting together our parts and uh, and Paul gave us free reign with the parts absolutely the only the only thing he asked me to do different than what I came up with was on Uncle Albert he asked me to play a part on the verses um that would reflect the vocal and it not just a a drum beat per se and uh, so, I mean, I took a minute to figure something out that would just go along with the vocal a little more. And he loved it. And we recorded that track. And I believe that we recorded that whole track with uh, Uncle Albert Admiral Halsey in one take. I mean, it, it wasn't separated and, and edited together. Uh, we wow. learned it. And the same with wow. Backseat of My Car and, and a lot of those epic songs that were on Ram. Mm-hmm. So it was it was one of those things where you had to come to work very uh, we were working bankers hours nine to six <laughs> Monday mm-hmm. through Friday. Let Paul would show up at ten ten thirty though. <laughs> so we had time to get in and get a cup of tea and uh, and relax and, and get our gear together and everything. And when he would come in, though, we would just hit it. Uh, he, he came in ready to work and. Uh, it was uh, truly an amazing experience. Every song that I heard was just, it was better than uh, the one we just recorded, you know, it just kept getting better and better and better. And so, you know, he, obviously when you're working with a guy like Paul McCartney, you know his past. I mean, you would uh, research the Beatles records, uh, the records, his solo record, you know, you would just kind of put yourself in that zone if you'd, you had been there recording those tracks and uh and we we i went to my ringo bag kind of you know? mm. i said well what would he like to hear here what would it be comfortable that would sound like it was something uh, that a, a beetle record would have on it so i would use that as my template let's say but it was uh it was just an incredible experience and to this day i've made geez a couple hundred records over the years and uh, mm. uh it's definitely my favorite and I, I listened to it again the other day. I bought a new iPad. I wanted to see how it sounded, and, and I just put on the Ram album, and it just it just kills me when you listen to that with with headphones. It's just a, a masterpiece, top to bottom. I just want to bounce off something you just said about. I believe your wording was that Paul gave you free reign on the drumming, with the exception totally. of Uncle Albert. You, you, you always totally. get the impression from what you hear that Paul has a very definite idea of what he wants. On yeah. his recordings, so yeah. it's interesting that that you said that because he let you have the freedom to do what you wanted, even though, like mm-hmm. you said, in your mind you were thinking, "What would Ringo uh, kind yeah. of play?" Yeah, uh, it was absolutely free reign. Uh, I don't know, you know, Paul. I, I did a, an interview for Classic Drummer years ago where they put me on the cover, and, and uh, the fellow that wrote it, Robert uh, Gerardin interviewed Paul for 23 minutes. He was in a car someplace in, in, in England, and he did this interview talking all about me. And he talked about the difference between working with Ringo and then working with me. You know, he, he realized that I was a session man and I could, I could get this stuff pretty quickly. But when we sat down to record a song, he would just play it for us. The second time we heard it, we would be adding parts that kind of fit until we worked out the intricacies of everything. We, you know, we might rehearse it three or four or five times to really get our parts down solid and all the different movements and time changes and what have you. But that was our job as studio musicians. They don't want to waste time when you're pay- they're paying us the, uh, the money to go in there and record. We, we, they want to get it right away. And it, it was just, he made us he bumped it up a few notches. He, he raised the bar very highly for us. And we got onto our most creative level, let's say. So it was just truly amazing. And, and because of that, uh, I was allowed to create what, you know, respond to what I heard musically. And he just loved it. I think that's why later on he asked me to join wings it's because we had such a great working relationship there was very little said it was played and uh i i don't remember many instances where paul said well that's not working for me you know that that just didn't happen right you must have just had the right feel for what he wanted yeah yeah i don't know if it was intuitively or because i was a a fan of the music uh, but 
it worked out great. And it's to this day, it's still, I'm, I'm more proud of that record than any record I've recorded. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So we do this like a round table here, Denny, and yeah. we're going to move over and, and let each of us uh, give you a question. And Alan, why don't you, why don't you ask the next one? Um, sure. I was just uh, wondering when you were talking about uh, talking to Ringo uh, about his drumming on eight days a week, on the, as it's seen in the film, eight days a week, you would have had plenty of opportunity to hear Paul drumming and he really liked drumming. There was an early period in the Beatles before Pete Best when he sometimes was their drummer. Um, mm -hmm. how, would, how, would you, um, how would you characterize him as a drummer? Was he particularly good or were there any particular quirks of his drumming that struck you? Oh yeah, he, he played musically. He just played, he, he knew the song. He was like Ringo. He played for the song. He didn't have a lot of technique, put it that way. Mm -hmm. But he could play a really good groove uh, he had a great feel for the song, and he knew uh, he had quirky little things. Like if you listen to maybe I'm amazed, but da but dum. Some of the stuff that he would play, the entrances and ins and outs of, of in between sections, you know, were very much him. It's kind of the way he played his guitar, his bass, and his and he sang. So uh, he, it, it had a, a trademark to it. It was definitely McCartney. You know, it mm -hmm. was it was pretty hard to hard to miss. Although I must say, he did play all my parts that I created on the on the band on the Run album when I wasn't uh -huh. there. He used all my parts on that. I must say, right. so I was honored to have him do so. Yeah. So you had you guys. No, had... I, every time I'd get up from the drums, Paul would just jump down. If I was, we were hanging out in the <laughs> studio, and I'd leave the drum set, he would just jump in and start banging. You know, he loved to play the drums. Mm. Hmm. You ever have a drum battle between? Do you ever have two kits set up and go back and forth? <laughs> no, and we never did that. We never did that. Huh. Although one day I picked up his bass and he played drums, and I couldn't play the bass. So <laughs> really. Huh. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, we did it on one of the tracks. So uh, I think it was like Seaside Woman or something. Uh, we were at Olympic Studios with uh, Glenn Johns, and we started just changing instruments. So that actually, Henry ended up playing drums on on. It might have been Sea Moon or something like that. I don't remember what it was, but mm -hmm. yeah, we we used to have a lot of fun fooling around like that. You um, actually also played some other instruments here and there uh, in their rec in Wings recordings over the years. I think you played cornet on one track at some point. I, I did, yeah, on a bunch of tracks, actually. That's me. I bought a pocket cornet on Portobello Road that was falling apart. But, uh, yeah, I learned when I was a kid I played every drum book that was written by the time I was 13, so... Uh, the bandmaster at this little uh, boys band that I was a member of in my hometown. He gave me a clarinet. He says, go home and learn this. He showed me how to play it. And then I went and fooled around with the reeds. And then he gave me a trumpet, everything. But I never learned to play a guitar or a stringed instrument. I, 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 I can't get my head around it. <laughs> hmm. huh. Okay. But I started with piano too. I played a little piano when I was growing up and till the piano teacher uh, saw that I was faking not reading the music and slap my hands. That was the end of that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. When you went to um, Scotland to uh, consider joining Wings, or I, maybe when you went, I think he hadn't quite proposed the idea of, of joining. I think you were right. just going over there to sort of on a semi-vacation to, to play. Yep. And, Correct. and what went into the decision to, or what were the discussions like when he, you know, brought up, let's, let's do a band and, you know, you had to decide oh, uh, whether to leave New York. And so it was that like? Right. Well, I, I was, uh, you know, we got there a day or two before Hugh McCracken. Mm -hmm. And uh, when Hugh showed up, we went up to the farm the first night ourselves, which was a trip in itself, just finding that damn place and, <laughs> and wrecking a, a rental car to get, it, there was no road, it's boulders and dirt, you know. And so by the time we got there, we just hung out and um, just, just just had a, a, a nice time hanging out, just the four of us, my wife and Linda and Paul and I. And then the next day, I think Hugh showed up and... Uh, we went back up to the farm again and we were just, again, just hanging out, you know, talking about music and, and stuff. And then he was saying how he, he really, uh, 
misses his old band. Actually, it was the, I think it was like maybe the third time that we went up there is when he brought up the fact that Hugh and I were there. And uh, I think the women just stayed in town that day, or uh, Hugh's wife and my wife. And uh, it was just uh, Paul and Paul and Linda and Huey and I. And, and he said, you know, I really miss playing in a band. Uh, it was such a good working experience. Do you guys want to, how about putting a band together? And so we talked about it. And uh, Linda wasn't even in the picture yet. She was just making tea. Uh-huh. And we talked about a piano player. Um, a friend of ours from New York who we both worked with, who was a wonderful piano player named Paul Harris. And uh, he said, yeah, okay, I'll think about it. And then Huey went back to the hotel that night, if you want to call it a hotel. It was <laughs> it was the middle of Scotland, I'll have you know. And um, mm. you had to put a shilling in the meter to stay warm and put a hot water bottle between your legs. <laughs> but anyway... Hugh came back the following day and said that he just wasn't into it. And uh, I think it was, uh, you know, Paul doesn't like to hear no. Right. And I Mm. I think it threw him for a a loop a little bit, to tell you the truth. And uh, Hugh just wanted to go back to his his world in New York. And his wife was a, a model and an actress. He just thought it wouldn't be the right move for him uh, at the time and said no. And so it kind of fizzled. And I, my, my wife and Monique and I just went back to New York as well a day or two later. And, but I told him, I'm in, just count me in. He said, oh, let me rethink this thing. And he called me uh, geez, a week later or something like that. I think I was producing Billy Joel's album, mm-hmm. his very first record. And Paul said, Hey, uh, I, I got Danny Lane from uh, Moody Blues coming in you want to come back and let's start putting this together. And I said, eh, can we wait a week or two? Let me finish this. And anyway, he said, you in the band or not? And I just packed up and uh, went over there. This time we kind of stayed and uh, Denny was brought in. And that's when I found out that Linda was going to be the keyboard player, uh-huh. which I thought that could be a little bit challenging, uh-huh. but she had, she had a great attitude. And so we just started in. And we we didn't really have a lot of time putting wildlife together. And before you kn- knew it, we were in the studio in, uh, in Abbey Road cutting that, that record. And I think five of the eight tracks were actually first takes. Yeah. Okay. We, we did not mess around with that. It was just, the tracks were done in a weekend. And maybe Paul spent another five, six days overdub vocals and all of the the overdubs we put on it and then mixed it. That, that album was done within a couple of weeks' time for sure. Okay. There's just one more before we move on to the next guy. When yeah. you went over there to, you know, for the first trip and you were jamming and just sort of, you know, getting the feel of each other as, as musicians uh, in a non-session situation, what kind of stuff did you play? Oh, a lot of the old Beatles classic, not Beatles songs. I mean, the stuff that they played in the caverns, you know. Uh-huh. He was making up songs, too. I mean, he didn't want to teach Denny Lane the Ram catalog by any means. So he was writing songs and uh, some of the early stuff that came out in, in wildlife. He'd already constructed those songs. So we were we were just jamming on those and, and then old skiffle songs, uh, all kinds of stuff. He was, he was, he was just playing, we were playing anything that came to mind just to kind of get a vibe between us. Mm-hmm. You know, although Paul and I had a definite vibe from, for, for doing, uh, from doing Ram. I mean, I don't know if you heard that track road all night, but oh, yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. we, we were very comfortable with each other after that six weeks of tracking for Ram because it wasn't like a bunch of suits in there watching what, what you're doing as a session man. You know, it was a couple of guys in there dressed shoddily. (laughs) We were in there just slamming away and, 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 and creating music. So at the farm, it was even looser. I mean, we had that farm vibe up in the middle of nowhere in Scotland and, uh, and, uh, you know, playing in a barn, <laughs> you might have seen some of the rude studio pictures. It, sure. it was very relaxed and uh, 
there were some extracurricular activities going on there, if you know. What I mean. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But it was it was fun. It was loose and it was fun, and I I was, I was in heaven. I was I was uh, I had a special connection with Paul, and uh, it was just in- wonderful. Okay. Well, great. So over to Steve. Okay. Hello, Denny. Um, hey, Steve. I- I guess I got I got to ask you know because everybody will will want to know what Linda was like and what she added to the group in your in your eyes. She was his security blanket. Linda did not add much to the group in the beginning. She had a wonderful. Uh, she was like Earth Mama, you know. She was like a Woodstock Mama. She was hippie. She loved music and she took care of Paul. Uh, I think Paul was going through just such a horribly rough patch in his life having to sue the other three his mates the other three Beatles and and uh, uh, the breakup of that whole thing uh, it was really an incredibly rough time in his life and we were never shown that although it was felt it was felt immensely believe me and Linda was just there for him. I think Linda was responsible for him, for getting him off of his ass to go make music again. It was so he was depressed. He he, uh, he would have just sat up there in the farm and drank Scotch whiskey and played his damn guitar and watched the sheep, you know. Mm-hmm. So uh, she was. I loved Linda. She was the other American in the band, and we confided. Occasionally, you know, she leaned on my shoulder here and there. She was sweet, but very hard, very hard, very difficult. She protected Paul uh, way beyond what was needed, actually. But we were a big family. We were in the trenches. My wife, the kids, and Linda, and the dogs. Uh, we were all in one big traveling circus, you know, and that's what it was like. And she, she didn't have much to offer musically she wasn't trained on the piano what she learned how to play for the songs that we were we were doing paul taught her you know it's a couple mm-hmm. of fingers here a couple of fingers there and i remember at the university tour he kicked off wildlife and she starts boom do 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 she forgot <laughs> it you know and stopped the band went over and he showed her the part and then we continued mm-hmm. you know Wow. So she's obviously Paul said once that he could take a non musician and and make a person like that play well enough to play his music. Mm-hmm. Which I thought was really odd. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, but he was, he, was ob- he was obviously talking about her though. I don't think that right. I mean he he wouldn't have done that for No, him. he wasn't really he was talking in general. He was talking in general that you don't need to be a great musician to make great music. Mm. And there, there's a lot of truth in that. But but Linda didn't actually have talent. She had a great background in rock and roll. She went and saw everybody. She was an avid uh, rock and roll. Uh, she, she knew everybody in the, the music. She knew the songs. She knew the music. Uh, uh, and she could sing along with it, although there was never a microphone in front of her. Now there was a microphone in front of her, and she was responsible to carry a, a heavy load. And and Paul, of course, would double all her vocals with her to make sure that it was in tune. And over time, she grew into the role quite a, quite a bit for uh, somebody that had no tra- little or no training. Mm-hmm. I remember playing the uh, Beetle Fest in Liverpool in, uh, it might have been 03 or something. It was a long time ago, but Henry and I were, were guests at that show. And we were playing with a local band that played wing songs. And we did My Love. And um, Henry and I looked at each other like you know, we both had tears in our eyes because the song was written about her. She was gone. Mm. And we were together again uh, playing that song. And when it came to the guitar solo, that was one of the reasons why Henry left the band, you know, mm. out of his Paul forcing him to play that. No, I was, shouldn't say forcing. Paul really strongly suggesting that Henry play that same solo, the iconic solo, every time because it was an iconic solo and it needed to be played that way. You can't improve on something that perfect. Mm-hmm. But uh, the, that that particular event, I mean, Henry and I played the tune and the band was okay and uh, and Henry got to the guitar solo and just played it like 
we both had tears in our eyes. It was a very moving uh, moment. Hmm. Can I forge ahead a little bit because I'm looking at the the reference material I'm, I have here said that the reasons you left Wings were never really clear. Could you could you talk about why you left? Well, there was a lot of financial problems. I was we were working. You know, Paul was Paul knew the kind of money I was making as as a session man in New York, and uh, and I was getting paid maybe one tenth of that. Mm-hmm. It was it wasn't even a junior executive salary in in uh, in, in England, and th- that was becoming a problem. I, every every time off that we would have, which was very minimal, I'd have to fly to New York and do a c- bunch of uh, recordings just to have some money in my American account, so my father could pay my American Express bill, so we could have a a dinner out once in a while. So, and we were living in a one bedroom apartment, a basement apartment in London, furnished. Went to the bank to borrow money for a car, a used car. Uh, here I am in one of the top bands of the world, and I have nothing to show for it because of all of the, the Beatles' problems with uh, the court receivership and all of the other stuff, and I was supposed to be a sharing member of this band. Well, that was the main reason. Uh, so I, I've said this many times in interviews, uh, so I'm not really... I don't mind talking about it. It's nothing that hasn't been said before, but that erodes away at a relationship over time. And here it was time to go down and make band on the run. And we still didn't have a contract an agreement saying that we were all shareholders of the band. And, and it was just inopportune. I, my only regret really is that I didn't sit Paul down before I made that phone call and say, Hey, listen, uh, we really need to address this. Uh, we have to figure out a way to do this. Because if, if that had been done, I'm sure that I'd still be with them. I never played with anybody they enjoyed spending time with or making music with as much in my whole life. And it, it, it really affected my life after I made that decision to leave, you know. Mm-hmm. And that decision was made on several several things it wasn't just the money it was some of the the treatment because we went from a family to when that when the when it got really down to the uh the nuts and bolts of what was going on there sometimes we got left out of it you know we were at the mercy of of whatever they decided it was no longer a, a band where we didn't have any say in it we did have plenty of say in the music but the business uh, we didn't have any say in that and so yeah. that was it you know I think you said there was a musical reason too to do with the fact that um, you yeah, thought it Henry would be. Left. Yeah. When Henry left, uh, I, I, I tried to con- convince Paul to to get another guitar player and and just postpone the recording of a band on the run for a month, let's say, and break in a new guy because we had really started to sound like a band and feel like a band. We paid a lot of dues to get there. And when he said, no, 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 we'll just go down there and we'll, you know, we'll do it like we did Ram. We'll all, it's be a bunch of overdubs. We'll do it real bare bones and then we'll fill it in. And I thought, I don't want to do that after the suffering that we went through, you know, the the university tour, the European tour, the British tour, you know, again, we weren't making any money, you know, I mean, it, and we were killing ourselves doing this and we had nothing to show for it. And and I didn't want to go down there and make another record without a, a, a contract in place or even a letter of agreement, you know, mm-hmm. and and uh, then do it musically. Uh, it would seem like they've taken a few steps backwards to me. Mm. Mm. Okay. Thank you, Danny. Go ahead, Al. Okay. Uh, just kind of following up on some of the, a couple of other things that you've mentioned before. Um, first of all, you McCracken is actually from my old hometown, Hackensack, New Jersey. And uh, uh, I was just uh, wondering if you could kind of enlighten us on what kind of set you apart from other session guitarists. Oh, there were a ton of great session guitar- guitarists mm-hmm. in, in that city, but Huey had a thing. I, I guess it was coming from the, he was a, a great acoustic guitar player. You know, he came through the ranks of the, of the, probably started out as a folky kind of deal and then uh, worked with every 
rock band around New Jersey, right. up and coming bands and all this till he got into the studio. He was just yep. a really a consummate musician that, that played every style and played it like he was creating it. And it was hard to miss when when he played those beautiful lines on, on Uncle Albert or any of those tracks on Ram. Uh, you don't really, I, how to, I don't know how to put a label on that, but he was just a consummate musician. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And he's the only, actually the only musician that worked in, at least in their solo careers, with both John yeah. and Paul. Yeah. So that's I'm surprised you didn't work with Ringo. <laughs> yeah. yeah, really, exactly. And you mentioned that uh, you mentioned. I love that Michael. story. I don't want to interrupt you, but I, re okay. I remember the story about you told about when he worked with Lennon. He yeah. said uh, Lennon said to him that Paul was just a rehearsal for him, <laughs> <laughs> for Lennon's band. Yeah. <laughs> and when I, I met John, I met John once. Paul called me up. I was. I took a little, we had a little break after uh, uh, we finished Wildlife and it was being made up to, to ship out and everything. And, and I, I ran back to New York to make some money and uh, Paul called me up and he said, I want you to go pick up the masters and take them up to Sterling Sound and master it for the American le release. I went, well, I don't know how to do that. He said, just take it up to Sterling Sound and <laughs> sit with the engineer, George, up there. He knows what he's doing. Just, you know, over, overlook them and and make sure it sounds big and fat. You know, that's all we wanted. And so I was sat up there with George, and I learned a little bit about mastering. And I said, can you make that sound a little fatter there? Yeah, <laughs> I didn't do nothing, you know. But he said, when you're done, take take the masters and take them up to Apple in, in the city there and drop them off. I said, fine, okay, I'll do that. So I go up to Apple, and there's John and Yoko there. And he goes, so, oh, John Lennon, hey, not so nice to meet you. He goes, oh, oh, you're Paul's new drummer, eh? <laughs> <laughs> That's all I spoke to John Lennon. Wow. He didn't ask you about Bip Bop? <laughs> no. <laughs> he was on the move. Uh, I'll bet. I'll bet. <laughs> That's funny. Well, as a matter of fact, you, you, you know, you were talking before about how much you enjoyed uh, playing on Ram and how much you enjoy it as an album. Now, you played on two other Wings albums, uh, right. Wildlife and, and Renro Speedway. Um, mm -hmm. And as you said, at least um, <laughs> at least the drum figures for Band on the Run are yours. Yeah. Um, but of the, the, the two albums that you did play on, how would you compare them with the experience of Ram? Oh, uh, it was a different, it's a, apples and oranges. You know, there was a different, a different head that a musician puts on when he's in a band uh, than when he's as a session man, let's say. You, you think differently, and uh, I don't, I don't, it's really difficult to explain, but there's a different uh, way of thinking when you're in a band. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not, uh, I don't want to say that it's limiting of any kind, but it's a different, you know, you flip a switch and you're, you're in a band. It's a situation, not a bunch of, of highly technical uh, session men that can really do anything and everything. Uh, it's what you have there. You try to make the music as, as good and as interesting as you can, just with that different head, if you know what I mean. It's, mm -hmm. It's really hard to define, but uh, so, I mean, Wildlife was really a, a first look at a new band. It was an honest, pure look at, at what we were going to, the road we were going to go down. And, and there was some great stuff on Ram, I mean, on, on Wildlife. There was really some, some killer stuff for very little time being together. And as Red Rose Speedway, I mean, originally that was supposed to be a double album when that, right. when that. We did a lot of recording for that, and uh, the band's growing all of the time. We had a, I don't know if the European tour was before or after it, but uh, we were coming together as a band, to use the term loosely. But mm -hmm. we really were coming together, and it was uh, exciting. It was exciting. And, uh, and you know, Paul covered up anybody's mistakes. Uh, he didn't cover them up. He made them louder. Is what we did. <laughs> if yeah. there was a mistake, we'd double and triple track it. And by the end of the, the night, it'd be your favorite part of the record, you know. <laughs> really? 
Yeah, yeah, I loved his attitude about things like, don't fix the mistake, let's explore the accident, he used to say. Huh. Pretty deep, huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> interesting. And as a matter of fact, now, in doing, you know, doing research for this, I was watching an interview that uh, you did uh, a couple of years ago, and, you know, your your roots are in are in jazz. Yeah, as a drummer, uh, can no, I you, say can I say one bad please, word on the air? Please, <laughs> <sure>. <laughs> I always use the line. I was a jazz musician till I started playing with Paul, and I had a great jazz career. But you play with one Beatle, and it really fucks up your jazz career. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry. As, as a matter of fact. Um, how does now? And, and, and I'm, I'm a non-musician, so Professor Cozen over here is probably cringing already. But uh, <laughs> but how do you? Um, how does a you know kind of like a lifetime jazz drummer go from? How do you transition into becoming a rock and roll drummer? I'll try to make this quick. I was in New York during that time when pop music was becoming new, the new American culture. The boom, 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 boom was coming into commercials and everything. And all of the old jazz guys who were doing the studio work, they had a hard time playing that music straight. And I had been to Brazil when I was in the Navy band in 1963. Mm-hmm. And I heard this Brazilian music, the samba music and all that, which is straight, straight eighth notes. Right. And I fell in love with it. And so the light rock was very similar to the Brazilian music, the straight eighth note, not swung. Okay. And all of, that's what got me started in New York because I could play that style. And my sometimes I would work with Al Cohn and Zoot Simmons at the half note at night and get get done at three thirty in the morning and show up at nine o'clock at CBS to record Ram the next day. Wow. Uh, playing, playing. Well, we were playing music. Ram was not rock and roll to me. It was music. You had okay. a chance to draw upon all of your skills, all of your background and, and play in between the notes, know when to play, when not to play, you know? Mm-hmm. So yeah. that's the transition there. I, I hope that was brief and explained the, no, that's, the situation. That's, that's fine. Ken, uh, go back to those tours that you were talking about from 72 yeah. and 73. How do you remember them? And how were they, uh, how were they received? especially the college campuses, playing all this really new music, no Beatles, you know, were young people receptive to this music? And did you notice in just that short period of time, in 72 and 73, did you build an audience that was really into the concept of Wings? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the university tour was, it was like old Beatles days. I mean, where they just went nuts. The lunch lunch room erupted. Hmm. Whether they knew the song or not, they erupted. They saw Paul there. They saw Linda. We just started slamming away and playing our music. We had to repeat a couple of songs because we didn't have a full set. Mm. We'd stop and start occasionally if we screwed up. Uh, they they just fell in love with us right off the bat. And I think we did 10 shows in a 12-day period or something like that or a 14-day period. Mm. 10 or 11 shows we did, and they were totally unannounced. We didn't know we were going next. We were just trying to stay ahead of the uh, of, of the press. And it was incredible. At the end of the night, we'd take the box of money from the kid at the student union door. They'd keep half, and we took the other half. One for you, one for you, one for you. And we had all these right. wads of pound notes and bags of uh, 50p coins. And uh, it was it was just great fun staying in Really funky hotels, and I'll tell you a real quick story if we have time. But that uh, mm-hmm. this is just my opinion. But one morning we were woken. We were staying in a bed and breakfast someplace. I don't remember in the north of England, and, and uh, we were woken by Heather, uh, Linda's daughter from her prior marriage, and Heather's were banging on everybody. So get up, get up, get, we gotta get out of here. The cops are coming. And we, oh no. <laughs> So we throw our shit together and, you know, my wife and I just throw the stuff in a bag, run downstairs to get into the van. And uh, apparently Paul had a slight altercation with the bed and breakfast owner over something. I never found out what it was. And he was flailing his arms and somehow or another, his elbow hit the guy in the, in the nose, you know. <laughs> oh, boy. So, you know what? 
I think that's where the term band on the run came from. (laughs) (laughs) I really do. Because we we were were lickety split. We were in that band and we were off to the next gig. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That's That's funny. I'm having fun with it. But I don't know. It could have been. Hey. Why not? That's true. What are you going to do at the fest, Denny? I, I, I always give my RAND clinic. Right. Which yeah. I love playing those. You don't hear those songs played because they're too difficult. And and I just play along to the tracks and let the fans shout out what they want to hear next. And then I'll t- attempt to play this, the original drum part, which is kind of easy for me because I played them. <laughs> but <laughs> even 40, 45 years later, whatever it is, uh, it still sounds fresh to me. And I, and I love performing those tunes. And uh, we want to make this year, we want to make some sort of a, a tribute to Henry, to dear Henry. God bless yeah. him. Mm-hmm. He left us. And uh, Henry and I made up a, an album uh, of Beatles songs done in, in a different style, in his style. And uh, he recorded with a, a little couple of his friends up there in Northern Ireland. They just went into a studio locally and they, they recorded a bunch of uh, Beatles songs uh, done in a different manner, of course. And then he sent me the files and I put drums on them at my home studio here in Woodland Hills, and it's called Shabby Road. Mm-hmm. Right. Oh and yes. It's really a nice record. It's very very nice record. I just, you know, it cost quite a bit to have them manufactured again. I just made up a hundred or so to to bring along to the to the fest this year, and it's probably going to be the last time the fans get a chance to to buy that record but uh i'm i'm shipping a, a box of those out soon to uh so the fans can whoever doesn't have it's not available anywhere and on my website I, I i still have a i still have a few that i can send out and i every once in a while i'll get or uh, an opportunity that somebody buys one and i'll send it off but it's really a good record and it's probably the last it is the last recording henry did i'm pretty sure of that yeah, and God bless him, man. He was he was a great guy. He was uh, very much a part of Wings and and its its character and the way it it it, oper- it functioned. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. Denny, when you look at the other drummers in Wings, how would you compare your style to say Joe English and Steve Holly? Oh, there's no comparison. Uh, none of them are any good. No, <laughs> uh, I, yeah, Joe was a wonderful drummer. I, I love Joe. He. Plus, he sang, bugger. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, he sang like a bird, and he, he played very good. And uh, I wasn't really familiar with Jeff Britton or Joe uh, or uh, any the, the guy that came after Steve Joe. Holly. Uh, Steve uh, Holly. No, Steve, Steve Holly. Holly's wonderful, too. In fact, we're going to get to play together Yeah. with Lawrence right. Stuber. We're playing at the fest together for the first time, and I really respect his playing. He's He's an, uh, an awesome drummer. I really like him as a man, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, we've never really played double drums together, which would be a, lot, be a great great kick in the ass. That's going to be fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Joe and, and Steve, wonderful, wonderful musicians, good, good drummers, and I respect them immensely. Okay. Okay. I have more questions. And Abe, 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 okay. Abe, Jr. Is a, Abe Jr. has always been one of my favorites. I mean, he... He grew up listening to a lot of my music, and I and I I love it. The, the last time Paul was in town here, well, not last time. Uh, they usually give us a call if he's got a little time that we can hang out a little bit, go over to the house. And but uh, he was here doing Dodger Stadium, and we were hanging out and after the show actually. And, and someone told me that Abe said he was really nervous about playing "Live and Let Die" in front of me, <laughs> <laughs> which is this is really hilarious, you know. Mm. Because he, he plays my parts exactly, and uh, yeah, no, he, Paul really, uh, really uh, lucked out with this band. You can see how comfortable he is with them, and they're all stellar musicians. And uh, uh, I think he's going to keep this band going as as long as he's going. Yeah, yeah. well, they, they've uh, they've been. He's had them together longer than the Beatles were together. Right. Yeah, longer and than I Wings. Think- I was going to, mm-hmm. I think, longer than the Beatles and Wings combined. <laughs> Probably. Is it 15, 14, 15 years? Something yep. like that, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a long it's, time. It's like, yeah, 15 to 16, actually. And then if you include Wix, that's yeah. even longer. <laughs> that's even longer, yeah. 
Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I know Brian's a good friend of mine and, and Rusty's become a friend and, uh, uh, you know, he, 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 you can't miss with a bunch of guys like that. It's some of my friends say it's the best Beatles cover band you'll ever hear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They really are reverent to the parts though. Uh, and, uh, and they, yeah. they play them like they're, they're virtuosic parts, which they are. Yeah. Why well, change yeah. something that's, that's, that's that good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. If, if I could sneak in a question, a, a non a non beetle related question, I've got this whole yeah. list of people that you've that you've where you've worked with, and yeah. there was one thing you did. Apparently, you played on a couple of posthumous Janis Joplin albums. Oh, just one. It was called the Farewell Song. Okay. Yeah, it's her last recording that was released from from CBS. What that was was after I left Wings, Henry McCulloch and I put a band together with a Chrissy Stewart from a bass player from Irish bass player from Spooky Tooth, mm-hmm. and Mick Weaver, English piano player from uh, Y and the K Frog, and we had this quartet, and it was called Druth, which is Irish for dry mouth. <laughs> 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 you can tell what we were into. But anyway, sure. we uh, went to San Francisco to start uh, recording out there. We're going to make some demos and everything at, at Elliot Major's studio called His Master's Wheels. We were invited out there by Elliot. And we started doing records like guys like uh, Rab Noakes and Andy Fairweather Lowe and, mm-hmm. and uh, Juice Newton. Right. Uh, we did a handful of records that, that Elliot produced. And one day he said, Hey, the uh, Janis Joplin estate just called me, and they have some live tapes of Janis that they want to release, but the band was terrible. Yeah. So what we did was we were in this dark studio, and in our earphone mix, we had Janis right in the middle of our, our spectrum of sound. And on the left side, we had a little of Big Brother, and on the right side, us, what we were recording. Uh-huh. And we replaced the band. Now, Janice was probably higher than all of them put together, <laughs> but she was on the money. She was perfect. Uh-huh. And the band was all over the place. <laughs> so it was difficult <laughs> because they sped up and slowed down. She didn't, but the band was all over the place. Really? And we replaced, I don't remember how many tracks it was, but, but, uh, there's a handful of tracks on there where, where it won't sound like uh, Big Brother. It'll it'll sound a little different, and that's us. Yeah, Henry, Chris, Nick Weaver, and myself. So it's almost Janice Joplin and Wings. Henry actually had a little scene with with uh, Janice around the Woodstock time. Oh, right. And so here we, here we are in this dark studio, and you can see his head's down, and his eyes are closed, and his earphones are on, and you could tell it was quite emotional for him, you know. Yeah. 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 Mm. Alan, did you have a question? Well, I was going to ask about uh, the the tours generally, apart from the, uh, you, you told one story about, you know, hightailing it out of that hotel. The band oh, right, was, right, 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 right. Yeah. Uh, I yeah, never finished. Yeah, the, 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 the university tour was great fun. The next tour was the British, uh, the the European tour, mm-hmm. where we had a seventy millimeter uh, screen behind us. I believe we were the first people to do that, the first group, and uh, we had the two seventy millimeter drive-in theater projectors, and uh, so we'd really gone up scale for that one, and uh, that was quite fun. Linda was really nervous as hell about that tour because. Yeah, the university tour was so under wraps, it was cool. But here she is going out for the first time and, and knowing, the, the whole band knowing that we're going to be compared to the last time they saw the Beatles. Sure. So we had to be good, and there was some apprehension about doing it. And uh, we started out, and, uh, you know, the gig was fine. Uh, we, we'd we grown quite, we had a decent PA at the time and and all of that. And, uh that tour was, I think we did 28 cities, and by the end of that tour, we'd really grown into a band, mm-hmm. and uh, they had that slight interruption when we got popped, some fan sent us some weed in mm. Sweden or something, but <laughs> so that wasn't fun. I'll tell you a quick funny story there. was I don't remember the reporter's name, but his father uh, interviewed the Beatles and uh, did something harsh with the Beatles, and so this guy now... 
he's, he comes after the bus and he says to us, he says, I'm not going to write a, a story about drugs or any of that stuff. I'm not going to write a concert review. I just want to write about you guys traveling as a family in your bus and all that and the way you live and, and on the road. So anyway, he came to a sound check. He was there for about 20 minutes or something and, and left. And a couple of days later, the story came out and he gave a full concert review. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah full concert review of that night and he wasn't even there huh. and flagged oh, yeah. it of course he put oh, it down so so we were staying in uh, that tour we stayed in some fancy hotels and, and castles and stuff But so Linda I, I guess Stella was very young but anyway she took a couple of turds out of, out of the kid's body <laughs> Put it in one of those Queen Elizabeth soap dishes and sent it to him. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wow. So you're getting the real dirt here today, guys. Yeah, yeah, really I was going to ask really you are. if you could tell us any wild touring stories, but <laughs> yeah. you, you barely need prompting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. There any, you go. Don't any, get me started. Others? No, no, let's get you started. Any others that you want? <laughs> And then the, then the British tour, the European tour was sold out everywhere we went and fans were reacting to our music, which was really great. Mm -hmm. And we were getting great reviews and uh, that was very successful. We loved it. We stayed in, sometimes we'd stay in castles. Uh, the Baron would cook your breakfast in the, mor in the morning. <laughs> you know, it was pretty wild. Only Paul McCartney could have arranged that, you know, but we, we lost money on the tour because of uh, the, the expenses <laughs> to sold out. We lost money, but anyway, wow. uh, John Morris was promoter on that. And uh, we really had a good time. Uh, then we did the next tour was the proper British tour where we played, ended up at the Hammersmith Odeon playing theaters and what have you. And we'd really grown into a band by now. And uh, so that, that was really a, a very eventful because we, you know, we had uh, Brinsley Schwartz was opening for us uh, mm. on several occasions. And, and uh, the fans knew what they were getting. And our audience was there. It wasn't a Beatle audience. It was a Wings audience. And we do, we really felt uh, proud of what we accomplished because it was quite a huge hurdle to get over. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we were we were really happy with the band. That's why it was so. We we went up to Scotland after that, and uh, we were working on on band on the run. And uh, that that incident with Henry happening, where Paul just kind of forced him into a corner with playing the same part. Henry was very organic and. He likes to play what he was feeling. And, and uh, there was a couple of times that, that Paul said, geez, I, I really, I just wish you would play it like you played it on the record because the fans want to hear that, you know, and uh, you can't blame either of them for uh, taking that stance. Mm -hmm. But Henry was, a, you know, he was kind of a, a rogue a little bit and he, he just, uh, mm -hmm. he'd had enough. And uh, he said, nah, that's, that's enough. I, I'm out of here. And he just split. And that's when the, that's when the beginning of the end happened for me because I, I knew the writing was on the wall that it, we'd just spent a couple of years, whatever that time was, of really being in the trenches and doing this out of love. And it was, it was going to end nasty. I knew it was going to end nasty. Yeah. It's a shame. It really is. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But you get but you get on well with Paul these days. Absolutely. I mean, uh, the day that 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 we heard that Linda passed away, uh, well, we'd seen him in in '93 or '4. They were out here in LA, and I hadn't talked to him uh, at length anyway for a number of years. And and I just happenstance. I, I said, "Come on, Monique, let's just drive down to Anaheim. We'll we'll just we don't have tickets or anything. We'll just go down and see what happens. If we can't get in, we can't get in." No big deal. We're going to go for a ride. So we went down there and went backstage, and I told one of the security guys in the parking lot, I said, hey, I'm a Paul's old drummer. Would you go in and tell him that we're here? And he looked funny at me, and he went into the – he drove into the, the arena, and uh, he came out 30 seconds later with a golf cart, and he said, hop on. 
and we went into the dressing room and uh and uh we were received like royalty and uh oh. lots of hugs and tears and Paul and Linda were there and all the kids were there and and my wife Monique was very close with the kids, you know. Ah. She occasionally with Rose if their housekeeper wasn't available, Monique would, would babysit the kids while we were in Abbey Road recording, sometimes till three, four in the morning or later, you know. Mm -hmm. And so it was we were a family. We were just a big family and it was uh, it was wonderful. But uh, that day uh, Linda gave me the home phone, which I think I'm the only guy from the past that has this. <laughs> wow. And uh, whenever I I feel blue and down in the dumps, I call Paul up and remind him to pick me up a fender for a Ford. Uh, no, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, if I want to talk about the old days or anything and just hear his voice and he's, he always picks up the phone and, and we always have wonderful conversations. I mean, he's, yeah, you know, I really, I'm really, I'm sorry that it ended the way it ended. I mm. really am. Mm. It was, uh, it was, it was, it uh, was, an, an, uh, I never had a relationship musically with anybody that I've ever played with. And like, like that one, we just looked at each other and, and this glimmer would come over us. You know, we, we knew we were all pointed in the same direction, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, it was, uh, it was really good. I miss it. Denny, um, one of the nice things about meeting you guys was meeting you and Monique. And I know you guys have been married a long, long time. How, how many years have you been married? Thanksgiving was 50. <laughs> mm, congratulations. <laughs> wow. Congrats, congratulations. Thank you. You know, in drummer's years, that's 150. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to share with everyone your secret? That's if I knew it, I'd bottle it and sell it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think it's just, you know, you create a partnership and, uh, mm. you know, over time you go through so much stuff together and realize that it's just easier to go through the stuff and fight it out when it gets bad. Don't just run, duck and hide, you know, fight it out and uh, compromise. If you learn how to compromise, uh, but first of all, you just got to love each other a whole bunch. You know, that's, that's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. just, you know, how, mu how much am I willing to, how much is she willing to put up with me? Believe me, I'm, I'm no piece of work. I'm, <laughs> I'm, uh, you know, I'm difficult. I'm difficult at times. Mm. We think about ourselves way too much. Mm. And so when you learn how to not be so selfish and think about people around you, it just seems that life gets better. Hmm. Sure. Yep. Okay. okay. I want to ask you about wildlife and also Red Rose Speedway. First of Go all, ahead. with wildlife, what do you think of it now? I mean, was it in your mind – the proper way to start the career of a band because um, you think yeah. of, you think of Paul you think of someone who I mean obviously musically he's all over the place and he's recorded in so many styles so many different ways but this was a very basic pure raw album yep. nothing yep. polished you know and I, I love I think, its honesty I, I I just think it was a very there's a lot of great tunes on there. Uh, not a backseat of my car or, or any of those epic songs that he'd written and ran, mm -hmm. but there was a, you know, tomorrow was on there. Well, that was, that was written during, no, no, tomorrow was on. That was a wildlife project. Yeah. yeah. But the, you know, I just love the fact that it, it honestly gave the, the fans a, a brand new, no punches pulled look at a new band. I, I thought that that meant the world to the, to the uh, fans that we were, we were connecting with. Yeah, there was a review that I read not long ago where the writer said it was such a, you know, a bold and daring way to introduce a band to the world. Sure. <laughs> it really yeah. was, and I agree. Yeah. And yeah. I look at uh, Tomorrow is a terrific track. A lot of people thought that should have been a single. Uh, yeah. Some People Never Know is amazing. Yeah. I, mean, um, I love the arrangement of Love is Strange. I mean, how different yeah. is that than... Yeah, we were just hit. trying to... We were the first white reggae pop group. <laughs> we were trying to, 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 to do uh, our version of a reggae song, and everybody was in love with it. Uh, although we couldn't play it exactly the way it was meant to be played, we did it our version. And I, I think it's, I get emails and people contacting me right and left throughout the years with that thing. Man, that was some incredible drumming on that. And, uh, you know, we were just making it up as we went along. 
Uh, it still stands out. A lot of people love that track, especially. So when you came up with this arrangement of Love is Strange, that was the band all contributing, or was that Paul's idea to do it? The oh, no, style? it was the band. It was. We were always fooling around. We'd take anything and turn it into a reggae thing, and we were rehearsing and fooling around. You know, we just loved reggae so much. Paul, I remember Paul and Linda had gone down there, and they were in Jamaica, and they came back to New York, and they came up to our apartment in the, in the city, and the, they brought all these reggae. Right? They were on fire. They were so enthused with this reggae music they just heard, mm. and so I knew that that was up and coming in the in in the in the new band. So we used to fool around with it and try to make it sound just like the Jamaicans did, you know. We even had a little uh, Jamaican influence, if you know what I mean. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, occasionally, but you know, we did our own version of it, and it was uh, it was great fun. So when we we took the old the old tune, "Love Is Strange," and and added that twist to it, it just really made it more interesting than making just a, a pop record out of a a remake of a song. So we we gave it a a, a brand that was uh, pretty in, intense. Mm. It's in fact, a, was it uh, was it Linda who came up with the uh, the reggae bridge on "Live and Let Die"? I don't know about that. I watched yeah. Paul write that song. I don't think so. I think that was that was Paul. It may have been. We were all heavily influenced by reggae at the time, but I, I think because that the, the film took place in the islands too, in Jamaica, I think Paul knew uh, intuitively knew. I watched him write. Okay, he read the novel the night before. He sat down at the piano. He said, ba bum bum you know, James Bond. ba bum bum ba bum bum ba bum You know, it just came up with some licks like that. And pretty soon he, he threw that whole thing together. do 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 melody he wrote the melody and then he realized that he had to have some sort of a reggae bit in there to reflect with the film being done in jamaica yeah was well, it matter to you boom and so it was it was quite obvious the way it, where it came from yeah Thank you me. know that i mean i watched him write that song within a half an hour he had it, it penned i mean it was all done and uh, we had our instrument set up the living room in his house and we just started fooling around and learned some parts and how we're going to play it as a band before you know it it might have been like a two-track running or something he sent it over to george martin he's he got together with George. George wrote, wrote the string section and the, the horns and the timpani and all of that. Before you knew it, we were in uh, Air London and we went in there live with the orchestra, all in the same room. And we were in and out of that studio with a finished track from beginning to end, overdubs, mixes, everything in three hours. Wow. <laughs> Pretty scary, isn't it? What did you observe about George Martin at that session? And did you see interaction between Paul and George Martin? Oh, of course, yeah, of course. I mean, George interacted with us every, you know, every time I met him. It's like, if you, it's like meeting the king. <laughs> if we had a king, it'd be like meeting the king. He was just the gentleman of all times. Mm -hmm. you, you knew the knowledge that he possessed and the way he carried himself just incredible incredible meeting a guy like that yeah yeah um i just want to talk about red rose speedway for a few seconds we know that it was first considered to be a double album were you disappointed when it was whittled down to one and did the band have any say as far as the songs were concerned no, that was EMI. I don't think Paul had much. Well, Paul did have say as, as far as what went on, but you know, it, it was some, something to do with, uh, I don't remember all the details of it, but it just seemed like it would be more uh, successful if it came out as a single record. And when he told us about the, that they made that decision, we said, oh, okay, all right, let's put the best stuff on it. Mm. And then we, we did kind of, you know, we were all very close to it. So we mixed the records, the tunes together. I mean, it was a band effort. It was never one of those times where Paul was alone and we'd hear it when it was done like Ram was, you know. Yeah. Uh, it was none, none of that. We were involved at 4.30 in the morning. We were still there with a handful of faders mixing our music and stuff. 
So it was a band effort, although that decision, I believe, was, was made by EMI that they just thought it would be more successful, and, and Paul went along with it, I guess. Okay. I had four of the acetates for uh, the, uh, the original double album as, a, as it was made from EMI, those four acetates, and me, like an idiot, I was at a, my first Beatle Fest in... Uh, here in L.A. at the Bonaventure Hotel back in way back in the 80s. And Mark Lapidus asked me to bring something along that, that they could auction off. And I thought, ah, what the hell? What am I going to do with all these acetates? <laughs> and I said, oh, yes. God. And, and, no. and I gave no. one of the four-disc set to be auctioned off for like, I don't know. 85 bucks or 200 bucks or something like that. Uh, and I'm, I'm told that if, if I had all four of the discs, it'd be worth a house. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> so I don't know. Maybe one day I'll research it and see if, if it ever surfaced and somebody else has it and I'll try to buy it to complete the set. Okay. I just want to say, um, you know, every now and then with every artist's career, you're going to find that there are a lot of album tracks that were never singles that you think is an absolute gem or mm -hmm. one of their best recordings. And for me, Little Lamb Dragonfly yes. is a masterpiece. Yeah, it's good, isn't it? Yes. Okay. What do you remember about that song? Because it, there's so many different melodies all interwoven, and it's just, it, it's, it's beautiful. It's gorgeous. Yeah. Well, it was originally written for Rupert the Bear. You know, it was the animated, the cartoon thing. I believe mm -hmm. that that was the original purpose of that song. And uh, so we recorded it during the Ram sessions. And it just sat around in the cans. And every once in a while, we'd, we'd, we'd revisit it again. And one day we were over at Trident Studios working on something. I don't remember what we were working on. But Paul was down in the studio. And so, you know, we were all taking a break. And, and I went down and I said, man, we should finish this uh, Little Lamb Dragonfly, it's too good a track not to put out. And so he said, well, I don't know what to do with it. And I said, well, listen, I got an idea. And I helped compose the the vocal backgrounds on that. And I even, it's one of the few tracks I sang on it. And that particular day, we finished the track at Trident. And I helped him write the background vocals and stuff like that. Uh, and we recorded it, and it was finished, and uh, then it later came out. And I, I, like you, I thought that it was an amazing piece of music to, to not see the light of day. Mm. So yeah. I kept prodding at him to, to finish that, and, and we finally did. I'm glad I did, too. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for doing that. It's a, it's, a jewel, it's a jewel of a song right there. And just Truly. everything, it flows together so well. Yeah, yeah it's beautiful. Okay. Um, anyone else have a question? Ask me what I'm doing yeah. today. What are okay. you doing today? That's a good question. <laughs> right, that's, okay. I'm talking to you guys. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, I, I've been doing a lot of interviews, though. There's a lot of interest in the old days with Wings. And uh, uh, I did an, uh, an interview with this guy. I keep going back to him. His name is Adrian Sinclair. And mm. he and some other people are writing a complete timeline of Wings that's forthcoming one of them is me and, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. we too we did oh, an interview. Right. yeah <laughs> i just think that this is brilliant i mean uh thank god monique my wife had a, a little little the french have these little diaries little black books with a gold pen in them that they keep day to day they make little jot down little notes and stuff and she had all of those days that i went to work at l's tree or trident or morgan studios or back to emi and you know, she wrote all of that stuff down. It didn't say what I did when I was there or any of that, but it, it had all the dates that um, that Adrian could put together. And I really, uh, I think that this is going to be a, a a great piece of work. That uh, he who who said that he was you were doing it with Adrian? Is that who? Alan. Alan. Yeah. Oh, great. I, I really commend you for doing that. Though I think it's a very, a uh, very nice thing to do, and I, I think the fans are going to love it. Yeah, we've come up with tons of stuff, and Adrian's been doing incredible work on, you know, getting yes. the session info together. And uh, last week I spoke to Tim Geelan, who um, engineered Ram, yeah. as you know. Yeah. And uh, and he had very strong memories of, for, for, for instance, your kit. He was really impressed with your kit. I, oh, don't I, know I, I had yeah. Ringo's Shea Stadium kit. 
You did really? I I oh, bought it yeah. from the museum, but you know, later on Ringo blew that for me. I thought I was buying the Shea Stadium kit from the Museum of Famous People. A friend of mine with a drum shop in New York went to the auction when they closed, got right. the kit for me. He kept the snare, gave me the two tom toms and the bass drum. So I used it on the Ram album with my dad's snare drum. There's a picture of it in the Ram uh, remastered book that came, comes with the box set. Mm -hmm. There's a picture of it, but. Uh, so anyway, when Paul went into the studio for the first day, he said, hey, man, how you doing? He, he said, your drum's over there. And he looked, and it was, here was the Beatles kit. He almost shit, you know. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> uh, uh, Gary. But it, it really threw him for a loop, you know. And uh, I used that set on uh, the Ram album. I don't have them anymore. Hmm. And I, I kept a head, and I understand that the head just sold at an auction for like $2 million or something. Oh, my uh, God. Uh, I kept it, but I can't find it. It got stolen or something happened to it, uh, but uh, broke my heart. But uh, anyway, Ringo later on, I see, I see Ringo a lot here in L.A. now that he's living here permanently. And I said to him, I told him that story. And he said, that, no, no, that wasn't, that was a copy of my kit. I have the original kit, which I'm not sure is for real or not. Because um, mm. it was, you know, there was only seven of them made up, according to this guy that uh, put the auction together. Mm -hmm. And it, it might have been, it might have been one of those kits. But if I had kept them, I'm sure they'd be worth a, a whole bunch, even if, uh, even if it wasn't the actual kit used at Shea Stadium. But uh, who knows? Danny, he had a lot of those. He had a lot of those at the exhibit at at the Grammy Museum. You remember? Oh, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I think and I and I think you're correct that some of the stuff in that exhibit was not the originals. Yeah. Uh, um. But I. That's I, the set I, that Paul Paul had one of Ringo's old sets up at the farm, and that's the set that we used to rehearse on initially. And, and, you know, I had this and the, the head was laying over in the, the other end of the barn and all of the key rods from the bass drum were scattered throughout the place. Well, that's the set that sold for $2.1 million. Wow. Hmm. And my friend, uh, the, the guy that owns the Colts, uh, Jim Ursay, he owns the Colts. Oh, yeah. He's a big sure. Beatle collector and he bought it. And I think he right. paid another $2 million for the original head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wow! Yeah, I remember that was the big story that came out of the Ringo auction was his his purchase. Yeah, so. mm, yeah, right. Yeah, but ran, you know, the Tim Gillen was great. I, he after we did Road All Night, it was just a jam. One day after lunch, mm -hmm. Tim slipped me a cassette. He said, "Here, don't tell anybody I gave you this." <laughs> <laughs> I thought I had the only copy of that in the world, and some years later. I guarded it with my life. Some years later, some fan sent me a CD of all the, uh, of Road All Night and all the original tracks, you know, the bare tracks with Paul on piano or guitar and Hugh, Hugh or Dave and me. No vocals, no, no uh, bass, no nothing. Mm -hmm. And I have that somewhere in my library, and every once in a while I, I'll run across it and I'll listen to it. It was brilliant. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, but also what Paul did to finish that, that album was brilliant too. Yeah. Now Tim said that basically you guys went in and did the just the basic tracks and all the overdubs were done later. Really basic. Yeah. yeah. And I I didn't hear it. I mean, I went up to one of the uh, the the uh, sweetening sessions up at A&R Studios with Phil Ramon when they had they were putting the orchestra on and well, I stuck my head in between sessions one day and heard a little bit of it and I was thrilled. But I didn't hear the record till it came out, and uh, I believe they sent me a, a box of them, and uh, I put it on the turntable, and I, I just sat there, like, blown away. Mm -hmm. Wow. So I, I got off the question there for a second. Oh, that's all right. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> what did you think of the, the remaster for Ram, the whole box set? I know, it was, it was, like Ringo says, you can finally hear the drums. <laughs> yeah. And they remastered the love show, you know. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah. No, it was great. I, I, I think it was really well done. It's one of the best I ones really... he's done as far as uh, yeah. deluxe package. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's an album that has really increased in reputation over the years. Um, yeah, you know, it's when very it, much so. When it when it came oh, out, there was all the partisan, you know, among the fans yeah. about you know John mm -hmm. or Paul or whatever. But but yeah. you listen to it now, it really stands up well. 
as one of his best. Oh, yeah. I mean, 45, what, 45, 50 years later, it's, it's still, um, it's current. It's better than anything you're going to hear out there. I mean, it's, uh, I'm really proud to be a part of that thing, but, and I, I'm really looking forward to doing my clinic when I, when I just play along to those tracks, because I have oh, to nice. kind of remember. In fact, I just did a, a book. We might as well do the plug for me while I'm here. Yep, sure. sure. I did a, a, a drum book, uh, it's called What Not to Play, <laughs> A Drummer's Guide to Crafting a Drum Part. And what I'm trying to do is get uh, young drummers to look at a piece of music a little different. Just don't play a beat that you think fits with it. Listen to the music carefully and get inside it. And, and I recorded, uh, there's a DVD in, in the book uh, where, where I play uh, Uncle Albert and Another Day and uh, When the Night, which is another track where right. you, you can come up with stuff that's a little out, out of the box, should we say. And, and I'm trying to get drummers to just think differently about what they play when, they, when they're when they making their drum parts to a song. And I'm really proud of it. Paul gave me the rights to the, just about gave me the rights to the material of his that I use on it. And uh, he also wrote the forward for the book. And on the back cover, I got quotes from guys like Ringo and Jim Keltner and... Uh, and some of my favorite drummers all wrote a little quote about the book. And, uh, you know, I'm thrilled with it. I'm very proud. I'm, I'm, I'm having some uh, made up, and I'm bringing those along to the show, too. If any fans uh, want to pick up a copy of that, I'd be happy to sign it. Great. Mm. I definitely mm. want to look at that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, I'm very proud of it. Are you they working came at... to me. Oh, I'm sorry, Denny. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say that Alfred Music uh, came to me with the idea. They, they wanted me to write a a drum book, kind of a legacy item. And it's got more than just McCartney stuff on it, of course. But uh, uh, I said, geez, I always wanted to do that. And I never would have done it if somebody hadn't asked me to do it. So uh, mm -hmm. it was, uh, it was a, a thrill for me. And it was hard work. I mean, the, the, all the licensing and um, all the other stuff that you have to go through to put something like that together was real pain in the ass. But uh, I, I'm, I'm happy that it's done. It's out. And, uh, and I'm thrilled. Do you have any non-archival uh, projects you're working on now? Anything, you know? Anything? Oh, sure. What I'm playing doing? with four different bands. <laughs> 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 I might be old, but I ain't dead yet. And, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I, I'm playing uh, this month. Uh, let me see. Thursday, next Thursday, I'm playing with a, a guy out here by the name of Dave Garfield, a wonderful musician, and uh, Will Lee from the... Letterman oh, bands sure. with us. Oh yes, and a guy from James Hara, a guitar player that played with Herbie Hancock. It's kind of a rock jazz fusion combination, and then we have three singers: Amy Keys and, and Alex Lichterwood or Lichterwood. I don't know how he pronounces his name. Mm -hmm. It's a uh, seven or eight pieces, and uh, we have a gig Thursday night, and I have a jazz trio called the Denny Seidel Trio, and we have a record out called Reckless Abandon, and uh, it's organ, guitar, and drums, and they're two of my favorite musicians, uh, Joe Bag on organ and John Cudini on, on guitar, and we did five McCartney songs in a jazz yeah. way, and uh, that, that record is, is still doing well. The fans love it, and uh, I'd like to play more with that band but i get a gig and one of them's working all of the time you know one of the three of us can't do it and so it's hard to find a time but that it's really great fun it's one, one of the most fun things i've ever done uh, that that trio we, we're working next month or we have a, a a gig here in la and uh let me see what else uh, I can't even think now. and then i'm playing with a band called route 66 where we do the old uh Joe Cocker and Leon Russell and Bob Dylan. We do music from that era, uh, and and it's great fun. You know, the sax player played with the Stones, and the guitar player played with Leon Russell. They're all guys that have been around and have great pedigrees, and we get to work every month or two whenever everybody's available. Uh, you know, we, we get together and, and do a gig. And uh, what else am I forgetting here? Oh yeah, and my wife just hollered Motown. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm doing a cartoon show right now, 
every week we go in the studio and we record. We have 50 Motown tracks to record for this Australian cartoon show. And they have kids singing on it instead of Smokey Robinson and stuff. But we're doing the tracks just like the record. And it's so much fun doing that. Uh, so I'm still active in the studio, playing live and, you know, all these other events that are going on. It's just, uh, it's tremendous. A guy my age, I'm still in demand. Great. <laughs> yeah. That's, That's great. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. You're more active than a lot of guys out there in their 20s. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm a year younger than Paul, so he's my senior. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I remind you of that every time. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, Mark Hudson, we've done this thing a couple of years ago. We went over to Liverpool, and uh, Mark put this thing together with Joey Mullen and Earl Slick and Gary Van Syok and myself. And we put a thing together called The Boys that, Who Knew the Lads. And it's on YouTube, some of the clips from the Liverpool performance. It's the only time we did it. We rehearsed for a couple of days in New York, went over there and did it. And it was great. We had the uh, Howie Casey Horn section. We had some background singers. We had a, a keyboard player from a band in Liverpool. And it was, uh, it was really great. I know that the fans are mm. clamoring for us to do some of these dates here in the States. Yeah. And, uh, and it's a, it's a no brainer, you know, cause we tell stories, our personal stories about having been in a band with a Beatle. And, uh, for some reason or other, we're not getting all the components together, the editing, the videos that we have. And, uh, so I think when that's done, I've been, I've been asked by a couple of bookers that want to do corporate events. Uh, we should be out there doing that. Uh, once a month or something just go play and uh, it was really good between the stories and the songs we do a couple songs from everybody's solo careers and then and some obvious Beatle classics and Mark Hudson does well he and Joey do uh, most of the singing and uh, but it's really good it's very very good and we, we uh, it's great to give a tribute to the the guys that meant so much to all of us Mm -hmm. And most of you will be together, in fact, at the fest. I know. Yeah. I know. Nothing's been said about doing anything of that. No, oh, that's too bad. Yeah. I mean, Joey and Mark together on stage were hilarious. I mean, they, they oh, were just... Oh, God, I can imagine. Yeah, it was kind of like Beatle days, you know, the the fun in the caverns and stuff. It, there's so much banter and stuff going on and telling stories. And it was really nice. Look, check it out on uh, on YouTube. You'll get a kick out of it, though. Yeah. It's either the boys that knew the lads or the boys who knew the lads. It's something like that, anyway. That's I'm how you find it. Write it down right now. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's worth seeing. It was good that's, fun. A lot of hard work, but it was good fun. You know, that's the kind of thing that's so great about going to the fest is that, you, you know, you get all these musicians that actually work with the Beatles, have their stories to tell. And there's nothing that's more important than learning about what they're like creatively. And yeah. you guys know about that. That yeah, kind of information absolutely. is priceless. So, yeah, sure. So it's the, you're, it's the boys who knew the lads, by the way. I'm, I'm looking. Oh, at okay. Them. The boys who knew the lads. Who knew, who knew the lads? Yes. Who? Okay. Yeah, you have to check that out on YouTube, mm -hmm. and you'll have to let us know, uh, you know, when you're playing on the East Coast in any of these bands that you just mentioned, and I'll be more than happy to uh, talk about it and plug it on my radio Good. show and. See if I can do any kind of promotion with it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, it's really great to see how active you are right now. And uh, couldn't happen yeah. to a nicer guy. So, Oh, thank you. I mean, I, I love playing. I love doing what I do. I don't like Ringo. I see Ringo all the time. And he, he said, I'm a drummer. So I get out there and drum. <laughs> yep. I mean, we're only happy when, when we're, we're needed and we're, we're out and being active in our crafts. Mm -hmm. I, I, that's, a, that's a good point, though, because I think a lot of people – don't really fully understand why Ringo does the All Star Band, and that's I mean that's that's the that's it. He just yeah. he loves to play right right down. That came I mean, right out of his mouth, you know. <laughs> One day he woke up and he says, "What am I sitting around here? I got all you know, you know, I got all this stuff going on, but I'm a drummer. Why don't I put a band together and play for Christ's sake? That's mm -hmm. that's that's what got me here. Why not do that?" And uh, he's pretty damn happy I mean, he's really happy now that he's he's living here in la permanently too i mean we were just okay. up to the house the other day i took uh 
Billy Amendola, the the modern drummer. Uh, sure. uh, right. He's the mm-hmm. he's the senior editor, I think. He and his wife stayed with us after the Nam show, and uh, he wanted to. He wondered if I could call Ringo up and uh, we could get an invite up to the house, just hang out. We went up for an hour and just hung out and uh, got a tour of the house. And Barbara and Ringo were just so charming as always. And and Billy and his wife, Chris and Monique and I went up and we just had a great time just hanging out, talking. He took us into the studio. He showed us the old microphone that the, that he had, one of his prized possessions that John used to use on stage. And, Mm. He actually had it between his legs. He used to sing on it too, from the drums. You know, mm-hmm. it looks like something like like an antique that came out of a space or something. It's really a weird <laughs> old microphone. <laughs> but, you know, I'm just uh, glad that I, I wish I w- would have had a chance to meet uh, George. I never met George for some uh, reason or other, but mm. uh, but you know, I'm so thrilled that I'm part of that history mm. and. Uh, I'm glad I still get called on to to do stuff, whether it's for somebody that's writing a book or playing a show or doing a clinic or something. It's it's amazing. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, we're unfortunately going to have to bring it into the show. <laughs> I smell dinner. <laughs> I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> but, Danny, uh, it goes without saying you're welcome to come back anytime that you want. Anything that you want to talk about as far as your current activities like you just did, you know, we'd love to have you on again. Great. Thank you so much. Thank okay. you, Danny. Yeah. Uh, All right. You guys have a good one. I'll see you at the best. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. See you in about three weeks. <laughs> That's right. right. See you later now. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye, Danny. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good night. All right, wasn't that great to have Danny Sywell with us? And, that was uh, fan- that was fantastic. That was <laughs> mm-hmm. that was absolutely amazing. We could have gone on for another couple of hours. Yeah. Easy. Well, we that have was- to have him on again. There's no doubt about that. Oh, no, no <laughs> doubt, no doubt. So. Okay. So uh, why don't we all just uh, let the folks know how they can get in touch with us? We'll start with you, Steve. Well, first you can get a hold of the show by tweeting us at uh, at sign things we said fab. The show has a Things We Said Today uh, Beatle Fans Facebook page. Um, we have uh, You can get a hold of me at BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com. I have my own Facebook page. I have a Beatles news group called Beatles News and Commentary where I posted the – right after I found out this morning the uh, or a couple hours ago, the, the Beatles Grammy win. Mm-hmm. Um, so and there's all sorts of little features there. And uh, you can look for my stuff on uh, Billboard and on, on Access. So I had a, an interview this week with John Diversa, whose uh, Grammy nominations didn't make the uh, the, the uh, he didn't win the Grammys, but he got nominated three times for his Beatle Jazz album. Which, by the way, I was going to mention is a very interesting album. Um, it's I, I, it's probably it's not everybody's cup of tea, but he goes the entire gamut from everything from rap to rock to, to everything to jazz and the ending actually is pretty interesting uh, it's a very interesting ending but anyway I uh, just wanted mm-hmm. to mention that about the album since it got nominated uh, go ahead Ken okay well I'll have to check out that album that sounds like the kind of thing I'd be into um, Al how about you um, easy uh, Facebook uh, Al Sussman uh, or uh, on Twitter at ASUSS49 or through Beetlefan Magazine, www.beetlefan.com. And, uh, and the Fest for Beetle Fans is coming up in, uh, well, as we're taping this, uh, in three weeks. It'll be a little, little over two weeks when you folks hear it. Mm-hmm. And you'll be there all three days. Yep. And I'll be there on Saturday, at least right now, Saturday only, on two right. panels at 12 mm-hmm. noon with you, Al. We're doing right. a panel on uh, the Beatles and radio. Mm-hmm. And also with Kid O'Toole, I'll be on a panel at 6 p.m. Right. on Saturday. Okay, and Alan? Okay, you can reach me on Facebook at either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. I'm on Twitter under at Cozen. And uh, otherwise, just through the, um, you know, the group email. You gave the group email, right, Steve? Among the many things. No, I did. No, I. No, I. Okay. Didn't. Well, it is things we said today. Radio show at gmail.com. Thank you, Mr. Cozen. Anytime. Thank you, sir. 
All right. And as for me, Ken Michaels, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. Be sure to check out my website, which is kenmichaelsradio.com. And speaking of the fest for Beatle fans, mm-hmm. Mark, Mark Lapidos has said that I can give away a pair of tickets for either the Friday show or the Sunday show. And if you go to my website, you can go to the ticket giveaways page. It'll explain very easily how you can win a pair of tickets to your choice of the Friday or Sunday show. So, again, that's at KenMichaelsRadio.com. In addition to weekly Beatles trivia, interviews, all kinds of fun things on the website. All right. Well, this has been a blast. It really has. So, for Steve Marinucci, Al Sussman, Alan Cozen, and our special guest, Denny Sywell, this is Ken Michaels thanking all of you for listening, and we will see you next time. Mm-hmm.